can I make a confession to you, my many sisters and fewer brothers here? I am not always hopeful. I'm not always hopeful about the world. With our lemming-like suicide packs, as we make this beautiful world God's gift to us, increasingly uninhabitable. And we've heard about that. With our inhumane humanity to one another, and even for remotely thinking for a minute, going back to what Sandra was saying, that it is acceptable that over one third of us don't have enough food or clean water to live. And I look at my lovely little grandchildren and I worry sometimes. I confess too, if it's uh, confession time this afternoon, I'm not always hopeful about the church. It's not quite as important as the world, I know that, but it's pretty important to me. 38 years in our ministry and I know it's important to many of you too. Our British statistics for the Methodist Church make dire reading, but we actually don't need statistics to know that in many places we're getting older and we're getting fewer. Now, just before you all reach up and minister me, to me, especially you, Steve, <laughs> I do have hope for tomorrow. Hope in the return of Christ, hope in heaven, just in case you're worried. I do believe, like Julian of Norwich, that ultimately, in the end, all will be well and all will be well and all manner of things will be well. It's the here and now bit, not the there and then bit that I struggle with from time to time. Now, I I know I'm probably the only one in this hall to feel like that. Am I? But when I do feel like that, I try and remember stories, true stories of true people I've met, Christian people who all this afternoon happen to be stories of Methodists, but that's just by how it is. And they're stories that bring me hope, and I thought I'd share some with you. I remember, for instance, being in Sierra Leone in 2001, only months after the troubles with Liberia had ended and the UN peacekeeping forces were still everywhere. In fact, one nearly shot me. And the then president of the Sierra Leonean conference called all Methodist leaders to Freetown to regroup after the years of war and violence. He didn't even know who was alive and who wasn't until they gathered there and they effectively relaunched the Methodist Church after seven years of not quite knowing. And a small group of us were asked to do a three-week crash course in ministry and we asked them, what do you need? Sierra Leone, they said, have started and set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like South Africa. Send us someone who can help us think about reconciliation and peace. So we did. And so it was that one day I found myself in a room where a group of women were in a circle talking with Margaret, our reconciliation person. The women struggled with the idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They were upset and they were angry. It meant that those who, had been raped, those who had raped and murdered could return to their towns and villages as if nothing had ever happened, they said. And these women knew who these rapists and murderers were by name. And as the conversation unfolded, they spoke to, of loved ones who'd been macheted, And then how some of them in the circle had themselves been raped. And after a couple of hours of tears and sharing, one young woman, can have been no more than 20, 23, said quietly, what would our Lord Jesus want us to do? And I watched a miracle unfold as slowly and at enormous cost they pledged to return to their homes and try and live as people of peace and grace in a post-war era. And they sang together quietly and they prayed for each other and they asked God for strength 
and courage. And the room was charged with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I was in tears. And I thought, I've seen hope. And it's wonderfully bright. And then, in 2005, I spent a few weeks in Cuba, another crash course in ministry. I'm good at crashing. It was a wonderful time, and I preached 27 successive evenings on the trot in different villages. We were there shortly after hurricanes Dennis and Katrina had struck, just as Irma did last year. And when we got there, the evidence of damage was still very evident. I remember one place particularly, the people proudly showed us round their newly rebuilt village and we slowly gleaned how they'd gone about it. Those who worked outside the village continued to do so, bringing money in for everyone. Everyone else who could worked on one or two of the homes until they were finished and then they started on one or two more. And the homes of the most elderly and the most sick were rebuilt first. And one group cooked the food, and another group looked after the small children. Their story about the simple church in the middle of the village was just a hoot. It had been badly damaged by the hurricane, so they demolished what was left overnight and built a larger, better church before even the authorities knew that the old one was pulled down (laughs) because it's illegal to build a new church. And they were so proud. It wasn't quite finished when we were there, but the walls were done and most of the roof, and the people slept there, the men at one end and the women and children at the other, until their homes in the village were able to be habited again. It might have been for our benefit, but I don't think so. But as they worked, they sang praises to God. A man on a tin roof started up a chorus and the whole village joined in. It was like watching a musical. And I remember thinking, would I be able to sing praise having lost virtually everything of the simple things I possess? And I asked the pastor, Enrique, what if disaster strikes again? And he looked at me and he said, then we'll come together again and we'll rebuild again and we'll sing our praises to God as if I'd completely lost it, asking the question. And I thought, I've seen hope. There's hope in the world. How much we, in the comfy, flabby, unpersecuted West, need to learn about the doggedness and the courage of faithful hope. But let's come a bit further home. Shetland, it's only a little further home, isn't it? I was there talking about fresh expressions some years ago and I stayed with a lovely Methodist couple in their 70s. Let's call them Donald and Zena. They were deeply worried about the youths on the streets of Lerwick, who they said seemed directionless and without hope and they had a real longing for them. So they planned to make a youth club in the church, a room much like their own children had had many years ago. And I said to them, as gently as I could, that I didn't think that would really work nowadays. And I proposed to them that they might think about appointing a detached youth worker on the streets, but it would be quite expensive. As gently as I could, but not gently enough, because Zena was quite quiet with me as we drove home. She went in a bit of a huff and I felt awful. But the next morning, we sat round the small breakfast table and they had this conversation between themselves as if I wasn't there. (laughs) Donald? Eh? We've got four children, haven't we? I thought, that's a strange question to ask somebody you've been married 40 years to. (laughs) Eh? And if our children and grandchildren needed something that they can't get, but we've got the ability to give to them, well, we'd give them it, wouldn't we? Donald, much more cautious now. He's got a bit of Yorkshire blood in him. 
not knowing what's coming, A. Well, I've been thinking, she says. Our church has made, meant everything to us. We met and married there. Our bairns were baptized there. Two of them were married there. It's where we found Jesus. It shaped our whole life. A. So if there's a chance that our grandchildren's generation can encounter and receive this faith that's been so important to us, we need to move heaven and earth to help them make it possible. And I thought, I've seen hope. There's hope in the world. Sisters, brothers, all these folk I've talked about are real. And there are Christian kith and kin. We don't always deserve them, frothy, superficial Western disciples that we are, but they remind us of that prevenient, comforting, courage-giving, gift-releasing Holy Spirit who is still abroad in the church and still abroad in the world. The Spirit brings courage in situations that need it, like Sierra Leone and many other places. She brings resilient joy in situations that really need it, like Cuba and many other places. She enables release and handing on legacies in those of us who actually in our churches hold the keys to unlock the resources which can enable enable our grandchildren and great-grandchildren to encounter Jesus Christ. And the Spirit's here, among us now, you know that. Inviting us today, this afternoon, to be filled with all we need to live so that somebody else somewhere might watch us and say, there's hope. I've seen hope. There's hope in the world. Yes, Lord. Fill us and use us and send us. And make it so today. Amen.